Welcome to the Grip Cannabis Connection, the podcast that explores the intersection of cannabis and business. Hosted by Corey Lord, a master cultivator of indoor and outdoor grow operations, this podcast is dedicated to helping listeners cultivate success, leadership, business, and community in the thriving cannabis industry. Hey, thanks for joining us. This is the Grip Cannabis Connection. I'm Corey Lord, and I'm here with Logan Hay. And today we're going to be talking a little bit about understanding the basics of outdoor cultivation. So one of the most important things you can do is actually selecting the best location for your outdoor cannabis grow. Um, sometimes you get uh, a say in this and sometimes you don't. I guess, uh, what are some of the yeah, environmental as you factors? Said, that selecting that an outdoor cannabis farm can be tricky. Rubber. Things I look for in doing so would be, what is your water supply like? What is the native soil uh, like? Would the canopy have full sun during the grow season? Is there tree lines or any cover from high winds? Does the field drain well or does it pool water after heavy rain? When does it frost? What is the overall general climate like? And will any of these cause issues with other property owners around you? What impact a grow could have on a community and will there be any sort of security issues? I'm experiencing this at first hand, so I can uh, honestly say that these are things that should highly be considered. Some of the environmental factors that you want to look into too is uh, specifically related to the climate would be things like what is your first frost date? Uh, how early is that? What kind of weather patterns can you generally see around harvest season? And what is your rainfall like early on in summer? Those are some of the things that I would highly consider. Yeah, I mean, really understanding like what your water usage is going to be and try to figure out if you actually have the uh, access to the water that you're going to need, I think is, you know, probably the number one thing. I mean, there's a lot of number one things, right? Like, I mean, obviously you're going to need water. Um, obviously you're going to need the uh, the acceptance of like local municipality and make sure that the neighbors aren't going to be, um, you know, really concerned about what's going on with your property. Trying to understand like everything in a whole really makes the difference here. So like there's more than just one piece of the pie or the, or the puzzle rather. Uh, and, and you really want to make sure that everything fits together. I mean, like selecting the perfect property for, for outdoor cultivation is way more challenging than it sounds. Uh, like none of this has really anything to do with actually selecting the, like the plot of land. Like you could want, you know, you, you could pick the, the most perfect place in, in, in the, on the planet to grow. And, you know, you may not be able to grow there. Like, you know, local municipality is going to be your number one thing. Like not all neighbors want, uh, you know, a giant cannabis grow next to their house, um, which, you know, it, it, it seems to be like it, it seems like that's a really obvious part of it. But uh, it's 50 50. Like we find that some neighbors really don't care. And then some neighbors are, are really, really, really do care. Uh, I'd say the trickiest part is actually finding an acceptable area to cultivate in. Like most farms, uh, like most farm properties with the amenities that we're looking for are in small towns. So, and sometimes, most times, like they're, they're hesitant to green light projects um, that are 50, 60, 90 acres, you know, and also so close to, to home. Some people welcome us and, and some people would rather that we go somewhere else. And we always work with the local municipality to help reduce the impact to local residents. Now, obviously we can't do everything to appease everyone. You, know, you get enough people together and, you know, half of them are mad at any given time for any given reason. Uh, but we really do want to work with people hand in hand to understand how we can reduce the impact um, locally. Uh, because we, we do know that, you know, people have moved here for, for various reasons and, and none of them had anything to do with uh, being around more people. So uh, that's, you know, something that we want to be cognizant of and, and try to really take um, the residents' suggestions to heart. You know, and if anyone has, you know, cause for concern that, you know, if they're anywhere near any of our properties, that they, they reach out to us to work through some of these issues. Because we can always find a, a solution and we really want to work together and, and, you know, figure out the best way to move forward. Yeah. And, yeah. and just speaking on that, you know, we property to recently on, our two really more or less newest farms were, were old farms or, or a property that was previously farmed um, by, you know, for corn or for hay. And, and that being in mind, it, it was 
a decent option for us to cultivate there, knowing that there was water there. But it made sense, right? Like we knew farming had taken place there. So we knew that we could actually, you know, farm the land. Typically, you know, you're, you're not going to find farms in areas that are you know, toxic, completely just trash land. Like there's going to be some level of fertility there. You know, the, the pH is going to be buffered in the soil to close to where we need it. You know, there's more than likely not a ton of harsh chemical that was used on the land. At, at least, you know, at the season immediately before the season you plant. So I think uh, the rule of thumb is somewhere around like three seasons um, that you want to wait. And we don't always get the luxury of waiting that long uh, to start one of these projects. But, you know, one of our newest projects that we're launching right now, we actually, you know, did get a few seasons to actually let the, the, the land rest a little bit. Um, before we decided to go at it full steam. The things what that some I like key would certainly consider our skill, outdoor and slogan, like, be prepared for is if that big storm hits, can you can you handle it? Can you afford to lose some plants or um, have damaged plants? Um, do you have the labor force to harvest in time and manage the day to day? Do you have proper space needed to dry in time to provide a quality dry? Do you have sales lined up for your product? Are you, are you able to combat the natural bug predation? Can you accomplish plant work schedules on time to optimize plant health? Those are questions that I'm constantly asking myself to be as prepared as possible for these um, things to manage at the scale that we're at these days. Yeah, yeah, I, I feel like a lot of people get lost in just like actually growing the plants, but there's so much more to the situation. My two things, um, you know, really uh, to consider when managing like a, a large scale situation is, is it's two very simple, two very simple things, uh, time and material. Mountains are made out of the simplest task at scale. Having an ironclad plan and the ability to execute that against your vision are the, the most important pieces of any project. No matter what size, too, like, you know, even a small project, if you can't execute against your vision, it's not going to matter what you do. You probably won't be successful or you'll really struggle at being successful. Anyone can come in with a plan. Like the key to winning is having the confidence and execution. Balance that with managing the urgency of task completion under budget and still finding time to make it fun and engaging for everyone. It's something only really people who are truly passionate about it are going to be able to pull off. I say if, if you don't love this, you, you you won't be in it for very long. You know, yeah, I mean, you know why no, no matter what and the scale, large, large or small, if problem, you're not you may not interested or care about the work that you're doing, you'll never be prepared for it anyway. You'll wake up and, and not care. Uh, so that being said, scale really doesn't matter for us. I mean, we're, we're, we're all about what we do. Most days, I would say, if not all days, I, I wake up and, and I'm pretty excited about what my day is going to be like because of what we're doing. I went to school to be a farmer. So this, you know, this is something that I have been prepared to do since I was in college. Yeah, you know, do you ever do you ever stop and think about you know exactly how how good that is, like how great of a situation that is? It's like, I don't know that many people are going to wake up every day and are like actually excited to go to work. You know, I mean, a lot of the people we work with are. So I feel like we're in a little bit of an echo chamber there. But like outside of our you know our specific company, like looking at our friends and other people that we know, like I just I I don't know that many people. That are that excited to go to work every day and really just get it hand, you know, even if you're getting your ass handed to you every single day, like you're definitely out there giving it hell, trying to work through the problems and scale, you know, trying to learn something new every day. And this is something we've been doing for a little while, not the longest time, but, uh, you know, for over a decade now. Uh, and it's come with a fair share of challenges. So I'm, I'm just really excited to still be here, still putting in the work, still building on the basic and still getting at least 1% better every day. Well, at least six days out of the week. Yeah. But, uh, you know, that being said, let's segue to this a little bit. Let's, uh, 
Yeah, this is a funny one. How how do you protect your well, outdoor cannabis plants? The same goes when, when it factors, rains or pours. Like when you know, I, I, I unfortunately have experienced similar situations such as this. I've woken up after a large storm to find smash, snap, sideways plants that make you want to cry when you see them. The only thing you can do at that point is put your big boy pants on and start chopping. You can do things like trellis, plant your plants tighter, put up windscreens, use greenhouses and, and structures. You can run giant turbine fans to break up humidity or stagnant air and things like that. Um, but with issues like hail and heavy rain, you have to rely on your methods and your plant strength and your plant health in order for you to sleep at night. You can't control the weather. So when temps rise, you combat with extra water and ensure your plants don't dry out. Um, you manage your spray program around um, your, your temperatures and your dew points. And, and really, you, you essentially become your own weatherman and hope that your techniques and, and your methods prove to, to favor you in instances like this. Yeah, dude, I mean, like, being perfectly straight with you, there's, there's not a lot. Like, as far as hail, high winds, severe storms, there's really not much we can do from, you know, from a cultivation standpoint. Um, we spend a lot of time and effort on, you know, plant health, supporting our plants, you know, as much as possible. Uh, so we hope that the work that we put in up front is enough to really get us through the most extreme weather events. You know, I, I do have a couple of, like, uh, tricks up my sleeve as far as the extreme temp goes. So, like, so, I mean, if, if it's going to get, like, um extremely hot obviously we can we can take that information the day before and water accordingly you know we we can kind of heavily saturate our plants uh, a little bit during the hot season to try to combat some of that obviously you know we'll you'll get a little bit of an evaporative cooling effect locally at the pot um and then that being you know combined with that just the uh the, the temperature of the ground water is going to be substantially cooler so if you continue to like steadily water those plants throughout the day or the week uh, maybe not overwatering them, but just kind of constantly moving uh, water through the profile. Uh, you can continue to keep that plant's uh, temperature down to a more manageable number. Uh, and then the flip can be said for, for frost. Like, so yep. if we're scheduled to have a frost, like we'll, we'll water the plants throughout the night to try to insulate that root zone and curb frost damage. Um, neither of these strategies are completely foolproof and really require a lot of attention to detail in order to see success. But uh, that's those are really the, the the two techniques you have to try to combat uh you know errant weather um, other than that you are really at the, the the mercy of mother nature all right so having a background coming from out west um originally we're we're both from missouri uh then we found our way out to uh, the pacific northwest to kind of start our careers in cannabis cultivation the biggest um, difference but, for me uh, how does the being out west compared to the environment here to in the michigan environment out west? when it gets cold here it gets cold out west you can see it coming and, and have time to prepare and act accordingly or at least with my experience out there i did i was on the west side of the cascades essentially so we didn't have to really deal with with too hard or early frost when we had a snowstorm come early october last year here in michigan uh, i certainly wasn't expecting it that soon but really the same strategies apply it's more so uh when when to apply these strategies the environment here is very it's on the same line as we were farming out west it's similar humidity, similar temps, but for whatever reason, the growth season here starts slightly earlier and ends slightly earlier, um, which we're totally okay with. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I literally, I'm gonna echo you know, the sentiment. It's basically my notes just say shortened season. Um, so, uh, where I was specifically in Western Washington was, uh, just, uh, west of the mountain range that, that he was talking about the Cascades. Um, and it came on like weather, weather patterns came on more gradually. So like we have a slower buildup to the summer where like, you'll see temperatures like, you know, nighttime temperatures creep up into the fifties pretty early uh, because it never really leaves there. 
So, you know, we, there is a little bit of a spring and then it segues into a really, you know, warm uh, summer eventually. It's snowed um, here in Michigan. Michigan. Yeah, it is literally like, like, you know, specifically now, like what, last week it was still in the 30s. It, yeah, so it snowed on May 1st and then we have plants outside that. 30th. May 5th. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that, <laughs> It could change quick <laughs> and it could change quick, but like what, what gives us the confidence is really monitoring that nighttime temperature. And we're not just monitoring one week, we're monitoring at least four weeks. So we're, we're looking at a consistent pattern of uh, above 45 to 50 degree nighttime temps for at least the sustained time of, of 30 days. So um, at any given point in time here in Michigan, uh, from basically March to now, you could have a short week of 70 degree weather or like a half a dozen full springs, I think is what they call them around here. Um, which if you've ever tried to plant during full spring, I think that's where it got its name. Uh, but that's it. That's kind of the punchline here is so you just have to be ready to move. Uh, you have to be ready. You, you have to know that the season's going to come on. It's going to always come on at least by this date. It's always going to go out by at least by this date and then just, you know, plan accordingly. So like when it's go time, it's go time. So you always want to be ready sometime between mid-May and early June for early plant production and then, you know, season prep for the field. And then uh, the, the season comes to an all stop basically in, in mid to late October, uh, pushing in any further past October 31st um, is really just asking for it and probably not going to get you the results that you're going to want here in Michigan. You might be able to get away with that in like the, the the southwest or even the southeast, but 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 not here. It's it's so close to your, your, your July. Your daylight so length changes um, significantly. It's come some yeah, of the end nicest of October, summer weather that you'll ever see. Um, and your, your, your July. Your daylight length changes significantly. Well, we got out October thirty yeah, first. Our goal. Any stories my about goal, the weather? My personal goal was always to be done by Halloween. Um, I I am a supporter of the Halloween um shenanigans and love to uh partake in that and um just a goal of mine since i started cultivating outdoors is to be done by halloween anything past that you're just you're you're risking your success and risking your uh product quality you know terpenes color bag appeal all that stuff will will drop off significantly if you wait too long to harvest Snowed on us, I want to say, in the second week of October. Did snow on you at harvest um, last year? I think it was actually around the 10th. And, yeah, people don't want to go out and work in the snow. And when it's harvest season and it's snowing, you can't feel your hands. Dude, I just remember pulling up and, and, and like, seeing everybody on site. And it was, like, it looked like between four and six inches of snow. I was just like, we're, we're, we're not going to get anywhere with this today. And then, uh, was that really that, that early in October? I thought it was like a little bit later than that, but it was early. Yeah. No. And that's, and that's why we say it's, it's so nice to try to get out as early as possible in Michigan, just because I mean, once it starts snowing here, it doesn't want to stop. Like we, we got really lucky, um, after that snow that we yeah, still it was had almost like two a, weeks of a uh, full fall to, to end the season <laughs> on. And then after that. Hey, the weather doesn't want to cooperate here. It's it's basically just trying to test your resolve at, at every point. Some of our best strategies, best strategies for maximizing our yield for, uh, for maximizing really come down to the basics, which is like water that. management, being able to see and know how to correct a deficiency or a lockout, being able to use your uh, your tools like your irrigation system by zones to maximize strain potential and proper techniques that involve a low plant stress practice. Our plant spacing is based on what our irrigation systems can optimally provide. It is also dictated by our licensed plant count and the property in which we are operating. We find that in outdoor cultivation, we don't want the massive 12 foot tall, eight foot wide plants they're a lot harder to manage and provide a lot less quality, uh, at least with my experience. And, you know, if, if you're limited to a, a plant count, you know, and, and you only have 12 plants you can grow or, you know, like, like 
a legal resident in Michigan can. Maybe you want those big plants, but on a personal level, if I'm growing for myself and only have 12 plants, I want to get the best quality possible um, and not so much concerned about the yield. Um, however, you know, if you're growing for production, you want to produce, you want to find that, that medium that satisfies both sides of the ball there. You want the highest quality and the best yield as possible. Some, some other things that we do to maximize and optimize our, our yield um, comes down to our pruning practices um, that can vary from strain to strain, but the technique does not change. We never want to over prune and cause excess stress to the plant. We generally have two pruning events for our outdoor plants and sometimes only one depending on the plant size. Um, we really never want to take more than 30% of the plant's branches or leaves off at any given time um, because at that point you're causing a stress event which could lead to other inherent issues or you know, wounds that the plant is more concerned about healing as opposed to pushing that energy towards a, a better, bigger, better yield. In the past, we have done harvest a, f a couple different ways. One way to, to help maximize a yield is to cut out your tops and, and allow the lower part of the plant to continue to grow um, if you have the time. Um, and then that way you can kind of separate your A's from your B's um, which it, it, I'm not going to say it's going to give you a, a lot bigger yield, but it certainly will help cushion the load a little bit. Okay, well, you at least get the, the highest value uh, material out first. So yeah, you can at least start the harvest process. You can start uh, you know, packaging, you know, testing, and then getting prepped for, for sale. So I, I really think what, what you're describing here is just trying to understand um, how to balance everything. Like, it seems like there's a lot, basically, like you're going to probably hear us say this over and over again. A lot of this is all about balance. Like you could over index on one side or the other and get, and, and get a result, but you know, you're trying not to get a lopsided result. So you're really trying to figure out what you can do to mitigate the issues with plant health combined with your yield goals and understanding what you can do in X amount of time. Basically understanding what your goals are and trying to balance that with what your limiting factors are um, is, is the best path to success that I found or that we found um, to date anyway. So, you know, how we did it for the, the current projects is as we manage or the current projects we manage is by taking our yield goals, balancing that with our property size and plant count um, and that really gave us the, the clear indicators to make the choices that we made, you know, year one, and then the choices that we still make in, in year three here in Michigan. Have we made, um, you know, additions to uh, the, the planning? Yeah. But like the bare bones, uh, the, the, the foundation is still very, very similar to, to the, our, our very first outdoor season. Um, we're, we're taking small uh, little nuances and things that we want to change with the projects and trying to make those uh, environments easier to work in. Uh, that's 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 one thing I'm really really good at is taking a large expanse of land and uh, it, and running out of room very very quickly. So we're we're trying to take you know the lessons that we learned in year one, uh, the lessons that we skipped in year two, and really start to try to apply those in year three on uh, our newest property. So um, it's always it's always a, a it's always in progress. Like you're never gonna figure everything out. There's always going to be something that you're going to learn that you're going to want to apply at, at, at a given time. Um, you, you know, you're not going to see it all uh, your first outing and uh, there's going to be, there's not going to be, and you're going to want to change so much by year three that just understanding how to stay the course and then just slightly pivot to make your situation a little better every year is going to lead you to a lot more success than trying to uh, change it all, scrap it all, change it all, scrap it all. Um, you get into that cycle, you're just not going to make any progress. So. Oh, here's a good one. Uh, how do you manage the harvesting, drying, and curing process uh, for outdoor cannabis, Logan? What are some of the for best us, practices? Managing the harvest, drying process, and curing and process. And then just done getting in, everything out. In a few out. different ways. Um, this year, we are going out on, and trying something completely different, but that has been around for hundreds of years. The, the success of, of your harvest will come down to your drying facility and if it's large enough to handle the load. 
and and your your time management and space management. This year, with another property coming into play, um, we're expanding into a new realm and going towards the more traditional farming method for drying, like farmers have been doing for hundreds of years. We're actually going to be drying in silos this year. It's a really cool uh, process that we are very excited about. There's major concerns, um, absolutely, but you know, hopefully, we can rely on our our vendors and and our people that are you know diving into all this, including ourselves, um, that we are making the right decision. We'll essentially be able to dry as fast as one day if needed, and and cut back massively on man hours and a huge space savings, which. As Corey mentioned in the previous question, that we run out of space very quickly, even if it's a 50 acre farm. Um, we just, uh, as a grower, you never have enough space. And, and, it, and it's the most common thing that you'll hear growers um, complain about is not having enough space. With the silos, essentially, like I said, we're going to be able to dry as fast as a day. For us, saving time and space is crucial when when trying to harvest before other farms harvest so that we can be the first on the market um, and, of course, beating the cold weather and the frost. Preserving terpenes is something that is very important to us as well, which is why we are very selective with our strains in our drying process. We generally see terpenes decrease at temperatures over 80 degrees. In the past, I have dried low and slow, which can help enhance terpenes, but also takes more time and resources to do such a thing, which is a lot more reasonable on a smaller scale. So that being said, we shoot for numbers like 70 degrees and 60% humidity for the first couple of days and then slowly decrease the humidity after that. With, with the silos, however, we're going to be shooting for a two or three day dry um, and, and we'll be testing our product to see where our uh, results are for our terpenes and cannabinoids and that sort of thing. Uh, there will certainly be some kinks that will need to be worked out. There's still going to be a lot of R&D, you know, so I feel like the, the first few spins in those are, are going to be, I mean, they're all going to be really hands-on, but like the first few spins are going to be like all hands-on deck to try to figure out exactly what we want to do um, as, as far as manage the product quality and the time of drying. We have a little bit of play built into uh, the schedule to take all the considerations from everyone on the team and then what we know to be fact to try to uh, give us the best shot the highest quality flower that we can and try to understand how we can encourage terpenes. Uh, we don't want to sit there and just blast heat on everything, roast all the terpenes off and make this, you know, every other bland outdoor experience that you deem scale. We're, we're really working to try to keep those things intact and preserve those things for our consumer. Because at the end of the day, um, that's our, our number one reason for being here outside of our passion for wanting to be here. We want to make sure that we can provide a consistent quality product that's, that's clean and produced with care. And that's, that's really all we're bringing to the table. Um, humble goals, but like really, really, really uh, audacious vision. Always a fine line between audacity and delusion, clearly. But uh, we've got a really good team with a really, really good heads on everyone's shoulders. And it's really been fun to watch everybody push each other in such encouraging ways, especially getting ready for the giant prop event that we're doing right now. So um, it's, it's, it's really exciting to watch, watch this season come underway, specifically about harvest. Like it all comes to a, like a very <laughs> calm, quiet finish on the farms, followed by a huge explosion of planning, budgeting, massive execution in concert with actively combating, spending time and resources on devaluing product. Um, it's all very exciting. It can be very stressful at times, um, but you just got to push all that away and just focus on what your goals are and then literally try to balance that with the expectation. On a hot, you have, everyone has a high expectation, so that's, that's the goal. You finish as tight as you can, finish, finish as, as well as you can, um, but you finish. There's, there's never been a season where I haven't harvested every single one of my plants 
and, and, and neither is Logan. So like th this is this is our, our, our North Star is, is actually finishing the project. A lot of people start, not everyone finishes. So we uh, we really pride ourselves on the finish and uh, you know adding a few more tools to um, our harvest plan is always encouraged. I would have never thought like two, and, two and three that's years something ago that's even. Super I exciting for us to know that scale that we're the at general right consensus around cannabis at. farming is gearing up towards farming. Yeah. You know, it's it's we're doing the same thing that the guy farming corn is essentially. It's the same plant time. It's the same harvest time. And now we're going to be drying in a similar fashion. I really hope that, that he cares about his corn as much as we care about our product. That's the punchline, right? Like it is farming. You try to inject cannabis into it and suddenly no one wants to give you the credit of, uh, of actually getting out there in the land. Spending the time, energy, money, resource, and then you know just try to balance all that with, uh, with actually getting to the end of the season. Was it? There's a saying that's like, "What the farmer's best friend is insurance or something like that." I don't know. <laughs> but uh, we don't have crop insurance, um, and hopefully we don't ever need it. But it's, it's all it's our, out there, though. Yeah, it's out there. All of our experience combined helped us come to the the finish that that we expect, um, and then we're always learning something. Like I said, it's always a very exciting time of the year. It's yeah, the planning, most planning your harvest and everything nine you times out of right 10 doesn't, it doesn't go as planned. So you risk. have to be able to pivot. You have to be able to have plan B and C and, and, and be able to execute those um, drop of a dime. Yeah, everyone's got a plan until I get punched in the mouth, right? Speaking of. Uh, how do you ensure uh, compliance with local state regulations for outdoor cannabis cultivation? For us to uh, ensure compliance, some of we have a team member whose sole purpose is to make that, sure uh, we are following all the rules and regulations. Where? Yeah, we, we, ha we have a team of team members. Um, they, they do the research, they make the calls when there are questions and help us on the ground level to make sure we are all clear and understand what needs to be done um, and why. We use metric, which is the compliance agency, which tracks a plant from seed to sale. And we do frequent audits on our products and our plants to ensure that everything is tagged properly with the barcode and, and that we are in compliance. Our licenses dictate our plant counts. We work directly with some state agencies um, to ensure we are following county or township regulations. Example of this would be uh, establishing vegetation in between our plant rows and around the farm to help with uh, runoff. Yep. DNR helps out with that. This was something suggested to do by a DNR group, and they are working hand in hand with us and in, in suggesting things to do uh, in order to help this. This will also benefit us um, and not just them because it will also keep the dust down. So this is just one example of something that we do to ensure compliance um, and, and work hand in hand with state and, and local agencies. Um, some considerations I would say to keep in mind is that you, you can always randomly get inspected uh, on a day's notice. So making sure that all your ducks are in a row at all times is always uh, a high priority for us. They're allowing us to grow cannabis legally so why why jeopardize any of that my, my main recommendation is just to work to stay in compliance and that's going to be a little different um region to region even even within the states sure you have like the same overarching laws um, and regulations but each municipal like each small municipality or township is going to have different things that, that they're going to want you to be cognizant of, um, you know, specifically like uh, artificial light in proximity to neighbors, operating hours in proximity to neighbors, basically anything you want to do in proximity to neighbors is going to be the, the biggest challenge that you're going to face. Um, after harvest, of course, that's still, I'd say the number one challenge, uh, but if you're actually getting off the ground and you're operating, 
I think you understand, you know, what the, the legal considerations really are, but you, you know, and just look I, a little like bit to deeper that, uh, you know, those, surface those level folks stuff aren't out to find us, uh, they're ways just to be doing their jobs too. Uh, you know, whether that's coming out to do an audit or what, or whatever of, you know, something like that, um, you know, they didn't just decide, Hey, we're going to go mess with this, with these guys today and make sure that they're in compliance. I, can't I like to believe that that's, that's not, not the case. Well, at least we're fairly certain that it hasn't happened. <laughs> okay, is it someone out there right now? But yeah, no. Like clearly, we're trying to do our job. They're trying to do their job. Nobody's trying to slight anyone. And and I think that the growers have come on to understand that we have to work hand in hand with uh with, with with local government and state government. It's, it's just going to make it a lot easier for everyone in the future that, that, that wants an opportunity of trying to cultivate. So, Logan, advice would you give Some someone advice I have who's new to outdoor cannabis to someone trying and, to get involved uh, they, in the outdoor they get started cultivation with industry is to be prepared for the worst to happen. Um, if you can't handle a bad storm, if it's going to uh, send you into bankruptcy or something because you can't harvest because your product went to crap, you know, it, it's probably not a thing for you. If you can't prepare yourself to be working harder than you've ever worked, if you can't be outside most hours of the day, if you don't have the means to get harvested in time, um, th you know, those are key considerations that I think about most of the time. I mean, if, if you're, if any of these, if you're not prepared for any of these questions, then it probably isn't the thing for you. Some ways that could help curve these is proper strain selection, knowing your climate and environment, knowing what your end goals are. You know, we talk about it a lot, but that that's really the kicker at the end of the day. If, if, if you have your goals in line and you want to achieve them, you can do anything. Yeah, I mean, that, that's just the bottom line, right? Like, if you know where you want to go, why not just point in that direction and head there? And We're you know, in our 10th year plus way, of, you know, of doing this. You know, we're, that, we're still figuring that, out, that but we wake up every day and we know what we want to do and we know what we have to do. Yeah, dude, that's my favorite part of all this, though. It's like, still, like, today, if not... Not just still being interested in, but being more interested in it now than I ever was historically. Like, I, I, I think that there's a real opportunity here. I don't take it for granted one second. Any of it could be over tomorrow. And I think that if, if, as long as you're ready for, for what you're trying to do and like, you, you know, you don't have anything to prove to anyone else. You only have to prove to yourself. But like... Wake up today and, and be better than, than you were yesterday. You're, you're only in competition with yourself. And don't look left and right and try to see what everybody else is doing. Stay in your lane. Keep your head down. Be humble. And just get at least 1% better every day. And, and don't take anything for granted. Because one day it could be over. Um, but you won't have any regrets because you gave it your all. So, yeah. Uh, I think that's going to wrap us up for today. Um, I really appreciate everybody tuning in. This is the the Grip Cannabis Connection. We uh, hope you've yeah, enjoyed learning a little bit about leadership, teamwork, and community uh, in the cannabis industry. If you want to stay up to date on the latest developments in cannabis cultivation, please be sure to subscribe to our podcast and follow us on social media. Um, and as always, keep cultivating success. Thanks. Thanks for tuning into the Grip Cannabis Connection where we explore the latest trends, strategies, and innovations in the cannabis industry. We hope you found this episode valuable and that you'll join us again for future episodes. If you enjoyed the show, please leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform and share it with your friends and colleagues in the cannabis community. And if you have any questions or feedback, feel free to reach out to us. Thanks again for listening. And until next time, keep on cultivating success.